I am a molecular paleontologist. Sounds sophisticated? Actually, I just made it up. Um, I spend most of my time in the lab or in front of a computer. But during the summer, I prefer to spend my days and nights in the far north, where I divide my time between waging war against mosquitoes and searching for the remains of Ice Age animals, which I bring back to the lab to extract their ancient DNA. As an early career scientist, I was interested in ancient DNA for three reasons. First, it was an opportunity to combine my interests in paleontology, geology, and molecular evolution. I could get DNA from fossils and use this to watch species evolve through time. Second, it was a brand new field, absolutely bursting with enthusiasm and excitement. A career in ancient DNA promised to be different, definitely cool, and hopefully useful. And third, I really wanted to go to the Arctic. So what about the Arctic is so good for DNA? Well, it is the best place for the long-term preservation of DNA. And the reason why is quite straightforward. It's cold. And it's been cold consistently for at least the last million years. This period was characterized by dramatic shifts between very cold glacial intervals and much warmer interglacial periods like the one we're in today. During the glacial periods, or ice ages, the, I the sea level was a lot lower than it is today because much of the planet's water was taken up into the glaciers forming on the continents. The lower sea level exposed a mass of land that connected the Asian and North American continents. This landmass was called Beringia, and it's where I do much of my work. Now, crucially, Beringia was not glaciated during the last ice age. Instead, it was a rich tundra grassland that was home to an equally rich diversity of ice age plants and animals. Today, most most of these species are extinct, but their bones and other hard bits, tusks, teeth, hair, sometimes even full mummies, survive, frozen in the ground called permafrost. We look for frozen bones wherever the permafrost is melting, along riverbeds, around lakes, and at active gold mining sites such as this one in Canada's Yukon Territory, while the gold miners wash away the permafrost to get to the gold-bearing gravels beneath, thousands of bones are unearthed. Over the last decades, I and colleagues from around the world have extracted DNA from tens of thousands of these bones and used them to better understand how Ice Age animals were affected by climate change, and in particular, the last Ice Age. We've learned, for example, that bison, horses, and mammoths really liked it when it was cold. This is when their populations were the biggest, their genetic diversity the most large. As it got warmer, many of these populations started to decline and eventually went extinct. We watched brown bears during the last ice age disperse out of Alaska across Asia and into Europe, presumably chasing after these growing populations of herbivores. And we've asked questions such as, why do some species, including the, the cave lion, go extinct, while others, like the caribou, continue to thrive today? And today we find ourselves in the middle of the genomics revolution, once again with growing enthusiasm to push this a little bit further. We find ourselves more and more frequently being asked and asking each other, can we sequence a complete genome of an extinct animal and, dare we say it, actually bring one back to life? To answer this, let me first recap very quickly what I'm going to call the seven badly described, deeply oversimplified steps to bringing an extinct species back to life. First, you have to sequence the genome. And somewhere in there are the genes amidst these A, C's, G's, and T's, the genes that code for the proteins that make the cells and the bodies and the behaviors of the things we're trying to bring back. Then we have to get these genomes onto the chromosomes, because chromosomes are the way that genetic material is carried in the cells. Then we have to get the chromosomes into the nucleus, and the nucleus into the cell so they can start to divide. And then we have to get the cell and the embryo into a surrogate mother so that it can actually grow up and develop and become something. And presumably, her genome isn't going to have too much to say about this developmental process. And then she's got to take this developing embryo and fetus actually to term. In this case, this is also not simple. There's a very large size difference between the much larger mammoth and smaller elephant. And it's not known whether it will actually be physically possible for a female elephant to carry a baby mammoth to term without disaster. But assuming disaster is averted and the mammoth can be born and learn how to be a mammoth, we then have to find a place for it to live so it can go about doing mammothy stuff and eventually make more mammoths. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so easy might be an exaggeration <clears throat> or an outright lie, but let's not get caught on semantics. Um, so where are we in this with the mammoth? 
The first attempt to sequence the complete genome of a mammoth was published in 2008 in the journal Nature. The authors managed to sequence 3.3 billion base pairs of mammoth DNA. When this was all put together and mapped to the elephant, it looked like about 50% of the mammoth genome had been sequenced. 50%, that's about half. So instead of this, we're working with this. But that's okay, that's great. That was state of the art in 2008, and it's pretty much state of the art today. In fact, does anybody know how many vertebrate genomes have been completely sequenced, including modern vertebrates, living vertebrate species? Give you a hint, it's not a very big number. None. Not even our own genome, for which an honest to goodness, ridiculous amount of sequence data has been published. We do not know the complete sequence of our own genome. I'm being a little bit unfair. We do know more than 99% of the genome, of the part of our genome that actually codes for things, where the genes live, the euchromatin. It's the other part, the heterochromatin, that is made of tightly condensed repeat sequences that are just super hard to sequence through. The heterochromatin doesn't make up a very big part of our genome, and it might not actually be that important, but we don't know because we haven't managed to sequence it for a living thing. For the mammoth, we don't know the heterochromatin. We also don't know where the genes are, much less where the specific genes that make a mammoth look like a mammoth are, so we can find them and use that to hybridize. So what do we do? How do we fix this problem? Well, it seems pretty clear. Let's finish it. We go into the Arctic, we find a really well-preserved mammoth bone, we take a chunk out of it and bring it back to the lab, and we sequence its genome. That's where the fun begins. If I were going to sequence my own genome, I could start with, say, a piece of my hair. And I could dissolve it up in the extraction stuff and sequence everything that was in there. And the results would look like this. Pretty much everything inside that DNA extract would be me, my own DNA. That's because I'm alive, my DNA's in good condition, and I'm, my hair hasn't been anywhere particularly weird. Not so for the mammoth. A similar experiment performed on a mammoth bone from Alaska resulted in about 50%, a little more than half of the sequences in that bone being mammoth. The other half was a combination of plant, bacteria, other stuff that had gotten into the bone while it was in the soil, and stuff that might have been introduced into the bone during the process of excavation and sequencing, if we touch the bone or breathe on the sample. But this is still pretty good. Permafrost preserved more than 50%. Here's a similar experiment for a Neanderthal from a cave in Croatia. Here, only 3% of the sequences in that extract were actually primate, and that includes both Neanderthal sequences and any potentially contaminating human sequences. But this is still good. There's still Neanderthal DNA in this sample, just not much of it. So presumably what that means is all we have to do is sequence a lot more of it. And to some extent, that's absolutely true. But there is another problem. If you imagine that our own DNA is like a rope or a ribbon or a party streamers, say, like those we're going to put up to celebrate the birth of our first cloned mammoth, then the mammoth DNA itself is actually going to be more like confetti that's been run over by a herd of mammoths in the rain. Water. Oxygen, solar radiation, bacterial decay, all of these things will begin to act on the long strands of DNA immediately after an organism dies. And eventually, that DNA will be chopped down into smaller and smaller fragments until there's nothing left. So this is what we have to make this, to make these, and eventually that. It's a hard problem. It's a problem that probably won't be solved without new and different biotechnology than what's available today. But as we progress toward this goal, we're going to learn a tremendous amount about these extinct animals. Knowledge that I have no doubt will help us to win battles against extinction that are happening in our world today. We'll learn where the genes are. We'll learn what genes make them look and act the way they did. We'll learn a lot more about how genes interact with the environment. And we'll finally, hopefully, discover why some populations and some species are so much more susceptible to extinction than others are. At the same time, we will get better at extracting DNA from our ancient, ancient bones. We will learn how to fix the broken bits so we can start piecing together these little tiny fragments into longer and longer fragments. If it's what we want to do, we will eventually be able to sequence the complete genome of an extinct animal. And then we will have completed step one. Thank you.